we continue in our theme this year, which is living the gospel. In case you missed that was our theme, you can look around the auditorium, behind me to the side, and then in front of me on these three screens that I can see. Living the gospel. Our prayer, my prayer this year, is that each one of us, under the sound of my voice in this church online or present this morning, would this year in 2022 begin to live the gospel. The gospel of Jesus Christ. The simple truth that Jesus Christ came to earth as God. He is God. He came to earth, lived a perfect and a holy life, and died on the cross, was buried, and rose again the third day. This is the gospel. Right? We find this throughout Scripture, specifically mentioned in 1 Corinthians chapter number 15. The gospel is all about Jesus Christ, but not just about him being a good person or a good teacher, but about him being God in the flesh, living a holy life and dying on the cross and raising again the third day. There is no gospel, there is, there is no good news if Jesus Christ stayed dead. Many people, many people in this world have died. Only Jesus Christ was risen by God himself from the dead. Now Lazarus was brought forth from the dead, but God raised Jesus. That is the gospel. But the gospel is not just a work that is to save us forever, though that is part of the work of the gospel. That we may be with God forever and ever in heaven. God does not wish that any should perish or that anyone should go to hell. Hell is not a popular word in 2022. A popular word is that God loves everybody, which he does, but God says, if you reject me, you will be separated from me in a place that is called hell. But the Bible says that God is not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance, believing in Jesus Christ himself, believing in him, and he promises life forever with him. Someone who is saved, the Bible says, to be absent from the body is to be present with the Lord. This is the gospel. But the gospel is not just for a future home. It is for today living. The gospel ought to touch us today. What we're saying this year, what I'm challenging challenge us to this year is to live a life where the gospel has done something intensely spiritual here on the inside. Intensely spiritual on the inside, but is visibly evident here. It would be a shame if Jesus did something here, but nothing happened out here. In fact, one could question even salvation. Did God really do something here if nothing changed out here? And it would be equally shameful if out here, of all that our life is just out here, and we're just putting on a facade, just some window dressing, the gospel, where God did something here and wants it to be evident here. Too often, we, we play at Christianity. We go to church and we think, well, this is good, I'm in church. We tell a few people about Jesus. We change a few habits in our life begin to have a little better integrity and say, wow, look at me, I, I'm a really good Christian because I'm a better person than so-and-so, fill in the blank. When the Bible clearly instructs us comparing themselves among themselves, they were not wise. If the, if the game is only comparison, then I can always find someone who is worse than me, and there will always be somebody who is better than me. But the game is not about comparison, it's about pleasing Jesus Christ. This is the gospel, living the life of the gospel. And God did not save us just to play at being a Christian. God did not save us just to appease a guilty conscience. God saved us by the power of the gospel to live a glorious, power-packed, victory-driven life. This is a life of the gospel. We hear the gospel, we believe the gospel, we share the gospel, and we're called to live the gospel. But I wonder if in your life there are times, there are moments that you feel that what you do and how you live is just a cycle and a waste of time. You get up in the morning. You get dressed. You go to work. You handle some problems. You come home. You eat supper. You go to bed. And you repeat. Over and over and over again. And weeks go by. And the months go by. And you have this feeling that all that I'm doing is just living this rat race, this cycle, this horrible cycle, morning to evening, nothing in life matters. You feel at times that all you do is stand in line for hours on end. 
All you do is run a taxi cab service for your children. All you do is spend time in the automobile driving to and from work. All you do is clean up messes in the house all day long. And at times, we can feel, we can feel that our lives are pointless and have no purpose. But the gospel brings purpose and a point to our life. The gospel brings meaning, direction, and purpose to our life. It brings meaning to a mom who is struggling all day with her kids. It brings purpose to a man who feels like all he does doesn't matter for Jesus Christ. No matter the occupation, no matter the, sincere, the scenario, when we live for Jesus Christ, that is a life of purpose. And Jesus describes this to us in Mark chapter 8. If your Bible's open, please look with me, beginning in verse number 34. And when he, that is Jesus, had called the people unto him with his disciples also, he said unto them, so these are now the words of Jesus Christ, whosoever will come after me, let him deny himself and take up his cross and follow me. For whosoever will save his life shall lose it. But whosoever shall lose his life for my sake and the gospels the same shall save it. For what shall it profit a man if he shall gain the whole world and lose his own soul? Or what shall a man give in exchange for his soul? Whosoever therefore shall be ashamed of me and of my words in this adulterous and sinful generation, of him also shall the Son of Man be ashamed when he cometh in the glory of his Father with the holy angels. Let's pray this morning. Lord, I thank you for your word, for this time that we have to look at your truth. Lord, I ask that you would help me as I speak. Lord, I need your strength. I need your mind for clarity. Lord, we're asking that your word would touch us today, that the truth would be clear to us, and Lord, that you would do something by your spirit that only you can do. Lord, I ask that you would do a work that we would be good soil, that we would listen well. And Lord, would you touch us and change us today. Lord, we'll give you the honor and the glory for it. In Jesus' name I ask. Amen. Here in Mark chapter 8, verse 34 shows us that Jesus has now called together the people and his disciples. I mentioned this briefly last week. There are times in Scripture that Jesus was talking to everybody. And there are times that he was specifically talking to the disciples, and other times he talked just to two or three disciples, and even times he talked just to one disciple on the side. In this particular passage, Jesus is making a universal instruction, giving universal instruction. He is not giving this just specifically for a certain group of people or just a certain type of people. He has now called the people unto him. Whoever wanted to could listen to this message. This was not an exclusive message, but an inclusive message. He was not excluding anyone. Anyone could come and hear this that wanted to. He had called them unto him. This is important to remember because the gospel is for everybody. And I can't say this enough that this message of the gospel is not exclusive but inclusive. It is the most inclusive message that I know. It seems everything else in life comes with certain parameters and certain instructions and certain ideas. You have to fit a certain mold. The gospel is for everybody. Young, old, black, white, rich, poor, skinny, fat, dumb, smart, doesn't matter. The gospel is for everyone. I'm going to test you real quick. Who's the gospel for? Let's try that one more time so you don't miss it. Who's the gospel for? everyone. And in this message, Jesus now gives instructions about the gospel, a life of purpose. Jesus brings to us, though, a complete and utter revolutionary thought. If we could, when Jesus gives this thought, it is mind-blowing. We're going to get it in just a minute, but we're, I want you to understand that what Jesus says here doesn't seem to make sense, which is often the way Jesus talks to us. What he says seems backwards. I'm supposed to love my enemy? No, 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 I'm supposed to punch him in the throat. Right? Seems backwards. I'm supposed to be, what? 
And here Jesus gives one of those statements again that is like, wow, Lord, what are you trying to do to my life? You're trying to turn my life upside down, trying to make it go backwards. Understand this, that when Jesus gets involved, it is contrary to our normal thinking. All right, our normal thinking in our own thoughts are usually not right. Jesus brings back a different way of thinking. And here it's a completely, utterly new and revolutionary thought. And here's the thought. If you save your life, you lose your life. If you save it, you lose it. Now that, at first glance, doesn't make any sense. If I said, listen, if you want to lose your money, save your money. You say, what? If you want to lose your money, save your money. But this is what Jesus says. If you want to lose your life, you'll save it. And if you save your life, you'll lose it. A completely and utterly irrational seeming thought until Jesus explains it. You see, when the gospel comes in to, to your life and my life, Jesus challenges these thoughts. Living a life in the gospel means losing my life, and it's a completely different way of thinking. It's not always just what makes sense to me, it's what Jesus commands me to do. It's not always just the way I was raised, it's what Jesus has taught me to be. It's not always how I see it or how my mama told me, it's about what the words of Jesus Christ are. And they're not just what they are to me. I don't get to reinterpret the Bible. I just try to understand the Bible. I know people who try to reinterpret the Bible. Well, you know, you see what, what that means is not really what it means. It means this over here. No, no, no. We don't get to reinterpret the Bible. We just have to try to understand the Bible. And here, Jesus challenges us with a completely different way of thinking. So we unpack these verses. I want to give us just three thoughts about what it means to lose your life so you save it. Parents, you ever been talking to your kids and you give them a mind-blowing thought? You ever do that? We do in our house sometimes. We give them a thought and they're like, whoa. Mom and dad, that doesn't make sense. And then they find out we're right. Parents happen to you, they find out you're right. They're like, wow, how are mom and dad so smart? Well, you see, son, you see, Danielle, I've been to school longer than you have. I've lived life. And really, some of the things we teach our children, though they may blow their minds, are really not, not all that earth-shattering, but they are to young children. Wow, it really worked, mom and dad? Yeah, that's right, it really will work. I shouldn't tell you this, but I will. As Pastor Lett often said, you listen so much better when I don't tell you these things. Sometimes I see Johnny sitting next to my wife, uh, who's next to my dental hygienist. Right? Are you technically dental hygienist? Is that your classification, Christy? Well, great to see you. If you like my teeth, thank Christy right there. She's a great job. Thanks for coming today. But Johnny's sitting there on the end over there, and uh, Johnny just turned 13. All right? So there are some times that Johnny begins to realize how smart mom and dad really are. We knew this all along. Every once in a while, I'll make Johnny ask me the question, Dad, is it hard being right all of the time? She I didn't, shouldn't tell you this. And he'll say, Dad, is it hard right being all the time? And I have a great answer. I say, nope, you get used to it. <laughs> now, I am not right all the time. I'm probably right more often than a 13-year-old teenager, perhaps, sometimes. But Jesus is right all the time. Jesus is never wrong. He says, I am the way, the truth, and the life. Jesus is always right. So when he comes to this concept and he says, listen, if you want to save your life, lose it, we're like, Jesus, you can't be right. Because that's not the way I was raised. I was raised that if I want to keep something, if I want to save it, then, then, then I don't lose it, I save it. And if I lose it, then I lose it. So Jesus, what you're saying is not right, but Jesus is always right. And he's never wrong. So we have to get in our minds this thought, first of all, that Jesus is always right, so we must understand what he's saying about losing our life and having it saved. When we lose our life for the gospel, we will find purpose, we will find a point, and we will find profit. But let me give you three thoughts about how we are to lose our life and what Jesus means by this concept. Thought number one, when I lose my life, it means I have 
to let go of my life. When Jesus talks about losing your life, what he is saying is, listen, if you're going to save your life, you're going to lose it because you're going to hold on. And so if you're going to have your life be saved and be profitable and have purpose, you have to let go. I'm going to try that again. If you want purpose in your life for the gospel and a point for Jesus Christ, you and I have to let go. We can say it this way, hands off the wheel. Let go of the control stick. Quit driving. Quit trying to manipulate. Quit attempting to manipulate the outcome. Stop living your life with you at the helm, at the rain, or whatever analogy you want to come up with. It all means the same thing. You and I have to, help me, let go. What do we have to do? We have to let go. Recently, the Lord allowed us to get another vehicle for my wife. And this vehicle has a self-driving mode. A little while back, I test drove a Tesla. I don't have a Tesla. I test drove a Tesla. Also a self-driving mode. I've watched articles on this self-driving mode. I've seen news reports about self-driving mode. And so I was curious to try the self-driving mode. Don't shake your heads at me. You men would do the exact same thing. You ladies, probably not so much. You have much more sense than us men at times. But you men would be in the same. Like, like is this self-driving or is it not self-driving? There's only one way to find out. On the highway and take your hands off the wheel. Right? Help me here. You're like, Pastor, you're, you know, I hope you have good life insurance. I do. I do. So sure enough, on the highway, I clicked it on and took my hands off the wheel. You're like, well, what happened? Well, it did what it was supposed to do. Right? It began to steer back and forth. And where'd you keep your hands? Like right around it. <laughs> I may act tough, but inside I'm a sissy. <laughs> right? I may act tough. Before long, before long, it beeped and said, put your hands back on the wheel, all right? Yeah, it's terrible. We talked about an Apple Watch when it reprimands you, when your car reprimands you as well. Everything is telling me what to do in life. Everywhere I go, do this, do this, do that. Wow, unbelievable. Yet, as I was getting ready for this message, I thought about that and the hands off the wheel. And sometimes in life, um, when we let go, we still have our hands right here. It's still hands off, though. The best place for Jesus Christ is like this. All right, Lord, you can drive. You can drive. This is the best place in my life for Jesus Christ to be. But sometimes, because there's still some fear, our hands may be real close. The point is the hands must be off the wheel. If we're going to lose our life and have a life of purpose and point for Jesus Christ, we have to learn to let go of the wheel in our life. I was reminded of the story of a missionary by the name of Jim Elliott. 1952, he and four fellow missionaries arrived in Ecuador to evangelize the, the, some Indians there, some, a native tribe. There's been since a, a movie, I believe, made about this. They were there less than four years, and they were attacked and massacred by the warriors. He was only 28 years old when this took place. By discovering his Bible, they found this phrase, written not when he was 28, not in the four years that he was trying to witness to this tribe, but when he was just 21 years old. He penned these words, he is no fool who gives up that which he cannot keep to gain that which he cannot lose. Or in other words, what Jim Elliott was saying was, if I lose my life, then I'll save it. In that situation, God called Jim Elliott home. Though he doesn't call everyone home in that situation, in that scenario. But Jim had it right. If I'm going to have purpose in the gospel, in the life of the gospel, I have to let go. And my friend, this is one of the hardest things you and I learn to do. To let go. 
Because we like being in control. We are naturally control freaks. We want to dictate what happens in life, how things turn out. We play scenarios in our head over and over, conversations. We think about interactions with the boss and with a coworker and with our children and finances and all these things. We want to control, be at the helm. And God gives us a rational mind, but he says, listen, in all these things, take your hands off the wheel and let me steer. If you want to have a life of the gospel, get your hands off the wheel, let go. But number two, number two, losing my life. I mean, he's not just letting go. And I've already alluded to it, but it means letting God direct my life. You see, some people let go and they let someone else direct their life. They let their friends, they let their online friends direct their life. What should I do? Here's the poll. Well, I'm not taking my hands off the wheel of my life to let you steer my life. And I like you. And I trust most of you. I just know that you won't do do nearly as good a job as God will. And so we take our hands off the wheel, but number two, we make sure that his hands are on the wheel. Proverbs says this, right? Familiar verses. Trust in the Lord with all thine heart. Lean not to thine own understanding. In all thy ways acknowledge him, and he shall direct thy paths. Or if I can, he'll steer. He'll steer. You see, it's not about me. I let go, but then I have to let God I wonder if you can answer these two questions. First of all, do you think God could do a good job controlling your life? You can answer inside, but do you think God could do a good job controlling your life? Like I said, I trust some of you, but not others of you. And you may say, boy, I would trust someone in this room to help me with a financial decision. They have some wisdom there. I trust someone else maybe for a medical decision, a medical insight, and someone else maybe with some parenting or a work or some other problem in life. But do you think, do you think that God could do a good job controlling your life? Personally, I think God could do a good job controlling my life. If he created everything in the world, everything I can see he created, maybe if by by him all things consist, then he can probably manage my life okay. But a follow-up question, is he in control? Is he? I think answered by these questions, that words to live by, that we say to God, whatever you ask, whenever you ask, wherever you ask, however you ask. Whatever you ask, God, whenever you ask it, wherever you ask me, however. I read this story about a quarterback, Roger Stahlbeck, played for the Dallas Cowboys and in 1971, won the world championship. But in an interview, he admitted that his position as a quarterback was tough because he did not have the permission to call his own signals. His coach, Coach Landry, sent in every single play to the quarterback. He told Roger when to pass, when to run, and only in an emergency, emergency situation could he change the play. And his coach said, and you better be right. And I imagine uh, with a bit more force. And even though, Roger said, I considered my coach, Coach Landry, to have a genius mind when it came to football strategy, he said, my pride said that I should be able to run my own team. And a football quarterback, a good quarterback, said this, I faced up to the issue of obedience Once I learned to deal with my pride and obey the coach's calls, there was harmony, fulfillment, and victory. I find that what he says often affects me in my life and you in your life. What we ought to say is, God, whatever you call, I'm in. You tell me where to run, whatever. You tell me where to run, wherever. You tell me when to run, whenever. You tell me how to run, however. But God, you make the calls, But our pride gets in the way. Our pride that says, I ought to be able to run my own team, my own life. I'm a pretty smart guy. I'm a pretty smart girl. I'm pretty accomplished. No, no, no. Once I let go, I want God to direct my life. Imagine that you have a yacht. I can imagine a yacht. It'd be a big yacht. 
And imagine that Jesus is on board your yacht. The question is, is Jesus the captain or the maintenance man? See, the captain's steering your yacht. The maintenance man just gets called when something breaks. And in my life and your life, too often, Jesus is merely the maintenance man. He gets called when something breaks. Lord, there's this big need I have. Call on the maintenance man. Lord, financial burden. Call on the maintenance man. Lord, the relationship over here, here, whatever, it's broken. I need your help. Maintenance man, come fix it. Rather than Jesus Christ at the helm. In order to lose my life, I must let go. Number two, I must let Jesus control. But number three, losing my life, losing my life means being content with the place he puts me. Losing my life means being content with the place he puts me. You see, sometimes we feel that Christianity is a cage. Yet in fact, this whole world is designed in a way that there are always rules in life. There's a, there's a law of gravity. Like it or not, it exists. Just jump off a cliff. You can't break it. God has set this place for us, and losing my life being, it means being content. You see, we are tempted to look around and say, well, Lord, why did you let them have that and not me? Normally in these situations, when we talk about these things, it's because someone else has received a blessing that I didn't get. We don't normally compare the struggles and the trials. We don't normally say, wow, why did you let them have that huge financial hardship? I sure wanted that hardship in my life. We're going to say, wow, why did you give them that sickness? I sure wanted that sickness in my life. Wow, and then you just literally have that sickness. Normally it's like, wow, Lord, you let them have that new house. You let them have that raise. You let them have perfect health. All things we anticipate people having that we don't get. And losing my life means being content exactly where God put me. This came to reality in the Howell House in the last few weeks. During Christmas, my wife came up with an ingenious plan or a terrible plan. I'll let you be the judge. Where she said, honey, can we buy a hamster for the children? Let me translate that. My wife wanted a hamster. <laughs> I'm fine. You know I'm fine with as many animals as my wife can possibly maintain in her house. She maintains it. So sure enough, it was her idea. She asked if I wanted one for the kids, and then she got one. So this is great, and I'm all for it. She brings this hamster home. After we said yes, it was before Christmas. I think she went that day to buy one, it seems like. And so the hamster was in my master bathroom for a few days, too, until she's like, I can't wait any longer. Let's tell the kids right now. So, right, honey, tell me if I'm wrong. They, they got it before Christmas. So this hamster, Holly the hamster. Okay. Struggle's real at the Howell house. Holly the hamster is a little cage. In this cage, there's a bottle of water and all the food Holly can ever possibly need. All right. We have a huge container of food for Holly. The kids enjoyed early on seeing how many sunflower seeds and Holly put 30 Three zero into her mouth. She's a little thing, and her cheeks were like this. My wife's like, don't do that because you're going to kill the hamster. And the kid's like, look, Mom, look, it's just shoving in there. Holly got out. Holly got out. Holly is not J.D.'s hamster. J.D. doesn't care about Holly. But there I was at night. My brother Joe's here. He was with me that night. We're sitting there in the, in the game room. I heard this scratching sound. We couldn't find Holly anywhere. Kids are looking. The kids are all over the place. And I hear the scratching. I asked my brother Joe. I said, Joe, what's that? Is that something at the front door? He said, no. And we look in there, and sure enough, we hear scratching in the wall. And Holly was in the wall and downstairs. Holly started upstairs. Now she's downstairs in the main floor. So I grab a drill. I take off the vent right there, and Holly sticks her head out. <laughs> Officer, I said, Joe, go grab me some cookie, a cookie. So he runs in the kitchen, grabs a cookie. It's like 1030 at night, right? And I'm thinking in my mind, I know what's going to happen. I'll put this cookie there. I'm a little trail right there. Put a cookie. Holly will run out. I'll grab the hamster. I'm going to be the hero. I put the cookie down. Right? Holly grabs the cookie, runs back in the wall before I can grab her. <laughs> I look at Joe with complete like shock. Like, I've seen this in cartoons. This doesn't happen, right? It's like, what do I do here? She's sitting there looking at me, just mocking me. 
very carefully put, I put a trail of crumbs. <laughs> Be smarter than the hamster. Trail of crumbs right there. I'm on the floor there, kneeling on the floor, trail of crumbs. Holly comes out. I go to grab her. She runs between my legs. I'm like, I can't grab the hamster. So now she's running between my legs. I get this hamster. My wife was almost asleep then. I walked the room. Honey, I, I found the hamster. Oh, good. Tell the kids night. Click. She didn't care. <laughs> In the morning, first thing she wakes up, she goes, was that a dream last night? Did you find the hamster? I saved the day. <laughs> and I'm going somewhere, so stay with me, right? Holly goes back in the cage. All right, the cage where she has water and food and a wheel. Not a week later, Holly gets out again. This time, we can't find Holly. Now they're asking me, Dad, look for Holly. You're like the, the, the hamster catcher, right? Can't find her. We got a live trap to put down there to capture her because we can't we have to preserve Holly. We can't find her. I'm like, honey, we're going to find this hamster by smelling her one day. This is not good. <laughs> Yet, it was just a few mornings later, I'm walking up from the basement, which will be on the treadmill a little bit, and I see this little white and black rat scaring him on the boxes. And sure enough, there's Holly now, who started upstairs, went to the main floor, is now in the basement. The next few minutes, I called the kids, and we, with, with, thankfully, with four of us kids and superior knowledge and intelligence, after 10 minutes, we caught this dumb little hamster. We put Holly back in the cage. But I noticed something, though. When Holly went back in the cage, the first thing that Holly did was start to eat. Because in the basement, there's no food for Holly. Then Holly ran to the water and just drank for, for a long time, because there's no water in the basement for Holly. All right, and Holly thought she was on, like, parade time. This is the, the day of her life, running around the basement. Except what she didn't realize was that by living in the basement, in her supposed freedom, she was going to die. She was going to lose her life. And the best place for Holly is in the cage. Sure, there are some limits to the cage. There are. Just like in your life and my life, there are limits in our life. There are things we shouldn't be doing. But in that cage, all right, until the day she leaves us, there will be water there as much as she can drink. There will be sunflower seeds more than she needs. When she got back in the cage, we did not restrict the sunflower seeds. Again, her face is like this big. <laughs> Just enjoying what's going on. If you want to save your life, lose it. Lose it. Say, God, hands off. I'm not driving any longer. God, you drive. And wherever you drive me, I won't try to escape. Because where you drive me, where you put me, is going to be good. Sure, you know, at times there may be something that, that I say, oh, well, you know what? It seems like there's a cage here. This is life. There's always rules in life. But inside the place that God has for us, there's every single thing we need. And if I can go one step further... There's more than we need. You know what would blow Holly's mind? If I dumped the whole food container right inside that cage. It'd blow her mind. Yet, yet I look in scripture and my Bible says that God is not limited by, by resources. He could unleash the bowels of heaven on us. Yet what do we do? We're trying to get out of the cage all the time. Lord, I want to be over there. I, I want to be in the basement and run around the floor. That'll be fun. Revolutionary thought. You want to save your life? Lose it. Lose it. Is God in control? Or are you in control today? Are you losing your life? Or are you trying to save it? Lord, I thank you.